Suppose that a friend calls you up and asks you for a ride somewhere. And so you leave your house, stop what you're doing, and you go to pick up your friend and give them that ride. And as you're coming home from dropping them off wherever they wanted to go, a truck drives through an intersection and T-bones your car. Your car's totaled. You wake up in a hospital, paralyzed from the waist down. Is it your friend's fault that you got paralyzed? If they hadn't asked for that ride that day, you would have stayed home, and you wouldn't have been at the intersection at that time when the truck came by and hit you. So you could argue that their actions, their request, has a clear causal connection to you being paralyzed. Do you blame your friend? Does your friend blame themselves? Do you blame them to the point you would ask them to pay your medical bills? That you would take them to court and sue them for the cost of your medical bills? Would the law blame them as well? Would the law hold them partly responsible? So in our last topic, we talked about criminal law. We have another system of law in America called civil law, also called common law. This is a system of law common to England and the U.S. that is sometimes referred to as private law because it's a law that depends on private individuals bringing cases to the court. In criminal law, once a case goes to court, it's formally considered the state versus the defendant. It's as if the government takes over the case on behalf of the victim. But in civil law, the case is referred to as person A versus person B or company A versus company B. And it's the aggrieved party whose responsibility it is to prosecute the case in court by privately hiring their own attorney. This system of law is based on precedent rather than on prohibitions. There's no body of legal rules that these civil courts enforce. Instead, people come to the courts with a conflict, with a dispute. And so the idea here is if the people have an issue that's never been resolved by the court before, that then the judge has to make a decision. But once that decision is made, any judge handling a similar dispute in the future is supposed to make a decision that matches that original one, that matches that precedent. And the formal Latin term for this is star decisis, standing on precedent. Another feature of American civil law is that compared to criminal law, it's more compensatory and less penal. True, sometimes... Sometimes civil suits do result in punitive damages. The court demands that the defendant pay damages that are effectively a fine, even though they're not called a fine. But usually the idea is that the defendant's being asked to pay compensation. They're being asked to make up for whatever damages they've inflicted. Now, the question I asked at the outset of this lecture is the question of who we hold responsible when we do suffer damages. And so a lot of what civil law revolves around is the question of liability. Liability refers to holding someone accountable for a grievance or a misfortune. That is, something bad has happened, I've had an injury, whose fault is it, and who should pay for it? Like other concepts we've talked about in this course, we can think of liability as a quantitative variable, as a matter of degree, as defined by how broad it is. So at one end of the spectrum, you have very narrow standards of liability. It's very difficult to hold someone responsible for a misfortune, an accident, or a wrongdoing. And at the other extreme, you have much broader standards. It's very, very easy to be held responsible. And to understand this more concretely, let's look at some specific types of liability. One is called relative liability. And in relative liability, you can't hold someone accountable, you can't say they need to pay for this misfortune, unless they've committed injurious conduct, and unless they've did it with a particular state of mind. So there's two necessities here. The person actually has to have done something harmful, and they have to have a particular state of mind while they did it. Like, for example, it had to be intentional, or it had to be something that they could have foreseen would have led to harm, and they should have known better than to do it. And you see this in criminal law, too, in deciding how severe a charge we should bring against people who commit homicide. The difference between manslaughter and first degree murder and second degree murder basically depends on the killer's state of mind. If it was an accidental killing or something that uh, was impulsive, it's a less severe type of charge than if it was a killing that was premeditated and intentional. The legal phrase is with malice a thorfault. We might see this in civil law with the argument that a person should not be held responsible for an injury created by a product they sold unless they knowingly sold a defective product, unless they did something harmful intentionally. Strict liability is a broader standard because it does not require any particular state of mind. All that it requires is that the conduct resulted in an injury. So it could be completely accidental. It could be something that a reasonable person would not have even foreseen would cause injury. But if it caused injury, you're responsible. You know, for example, I sold you a product and you used my product in some wacky, wacky way. Like you see these warnings on products in stores, like a curling iron saying, do not insert this hot curling iron into any orifice. Or a microwave that says, do not dry your pets in the microwave. And those warning stickers are there 
because probably somebody did this thing that no reasonable person would have thought to have done with this product and injured themselves. And even though the manufacturer was not negligent, they sold a perfectly fine working product with no, and they could not have reasonably foreseen to warn somebody, don't dry your pet poodle in the microwave, they're still held responsible and they still get sued. And that's why they put these warning labels on things. Even broader than that's absolute liability. In absolute liability, you don't have to have done anything in particular, and you don't have to have thought anything in particular. You can be held responsible just for being there. In absolute liability, liability depends only on your social location. People are held responsible just because of who they are or where they are. And you can see this in one subtype of absolute liability, collective liability. And this is when all members of a social category are held responsible for the wrongdoing of some other member. This is a social logic of things like feuds. A member of family A kills a member of family B, then it's open season on any member of family A. This is also the logic you see in ethnic conflicts, people being held responsible for something a member of their group did. And you'll get these you know, conflicts where someone says, you guys have always been killing us for the past hundred years, and maybe the person they're saying it to has never killed anyone in their life, but because you know they belong to the enemy category, they're treated as an enemy. It's something that dominates a lot of conflicts in human history. Whenever you see people being held responsible for the sins of their ancestors, or people who just happen to be the same religion or color as them, you're seeing collective liability, which is a kind of absolute liability, where your conduct and your mental state are irrelevant. It's who you are that makes you guilty. So again, think of this in terms of degrees of liability, with relative liability being at the end of narrower standards, strict being somewhat broader, and absolute liability being broader still. What explains the degree of liability? Well, Black built on his earlier theory of law with a theory of liability. One idea from this theory is that liability increases with social distance. The greater the relational and cultural distance between the parties in a conflict, the more likely they are to use a broad standard of liability against one another, which partly explains why you see collective liability so much in, say, inter-ethnic conflict. Another idea is that the liability of groups is greater than the liability of individuals. So liability increases with organization. If the alleged offender is an organization, they tend to be held to broader standards of liability. And it's one reason we see a lot of broad standards of liability in corporate law, where companies might be sued for people using their products in all kinds of bizarre ways that you wouldn't think someone else could be held responsible for. And it helps us understand the evolution of liability in American civil law. If you look back in the 19th century, which was a time of great individualism, it was a time in between the older world of large family groups, extended families, but before the rise of large corporations. Most businesses were run by individuals and nuclear families. And in the 19th century, standards of liability were extremely narrow. At best, you could say they had relative liability, but really, the standards were so narrow, some people have argued that the system in the 19th century was a system of no liability. It was extremely difficult to show that, say, a railroad or other corporation had caused your injury. There were all kinds of extra standards the courts piled onto this. Like, it had to be a very proximate cause. There were even cases where, like, if a fire at a railway caused the house of a person living next to the railway to catch fire, maybe they could be held responsible for that. But if that fire then spread to the next house over, then that wasn't their fault, because really, technically, your house didn't catch fire because of the fire at our railway. Your house caught fire because of the fire at the neighbor's house in between you and the railway. So that, they had all these sort of extra conditions to make liability extremely narrow. And what we saw going into the 20th century, and including up to today, is standards of liability became much broader. In the 20th century, we saw the rise of strict liability. It doesn't matter what your intentions were. It doesn't matter if you were negligent. What matters is that your actions caused somebody to suffer harm. And we've even seen the rise of absolute liability. And this is kind of what workman's compensation is. You know, by the mid-20th century, workman's compensation had grown to be something where it doesn't matter if you were screwing around at work and violating the safety rules, you get hurt, the company should still pay for your injury. They should still give you some money because you were injured on the job. And you've even seen cases where people were injured on the job and things completely unrelated to their job. Like if you're like a waiter at a restaurant and a psychopath breaks into the restaurant and shoots up the place, the restaurant might have to pay you workman's compensation while you recover from your bullet wounds. Even though the fact that you were a waiter had really nothing to do with the fact that a random psycho shot you. Could have just have easily been shot because you were a customer sitting at the restaurant. It doesn't matter. And Black's explanation for this is that one thing we saw in the late 19th century going into the 20th and continuing on to today is the rise of corporations. Our world is now a world so saturated in corporations, we probably have trouble understanding what it was like 100 years ago when they were rare. I mean, everything we deal with nowadays is a large corporation. I get my cable from Comcast. I buy things from Amazon. I shop at Walmart. Our whole life is spent in this web work of large corporations. And this high degree of organization, the fact that our society is permeated with these larger groups is one of the things contributing to broader standards of liability. Standards that would have been completely dismissed and laughed out of court 100 years ago. And you see these 
cases that might seem ridiculous to observers where, say, uh, a man is in a phone booth and a drunk driver plows into it and kills him and his family sues the manufacturer of the phone booth or sues the car maker. There was a case where, you know, some pirates or terrorists or something took over a cruise ship and killed one of the hostages they took on the cruise ship and the dead hostage's family didn't just sue the cruise ship, they sued the travel agency who booked the cruise ship. Now, this tendency of organizations to be held broadly liable for all kinds of misfortunes runs counter to another tendency we've already learned about, and that's that organizations tend to repel law. Because organizations are kind of status, highly organized defendants are way more successful. And so... What we see is a pattern where organizations might be sued for a wider variety of things, but overall, if you look at who wins in court, organizations tend to win their lawsuits far more often. In fact, studies of civil courts find that organizations bring the majority of lawsuits in civil courts. In small claims courts, most cases are brought by organizations. Small claims courts are effectively taxpayer-subsidized debt collection for hospitals and credit card companies. And if you look at who wins in litigation, organizations are far more successful than individuals. The most successful outcomes are when organizations sue individuals. The least successful outcomes are when individuals sue organizations. In the news, you'll see these eye-catching cases where an organization, a corporation, is sued for something that might seem ridiculous to a lot of people. Like the big case back in the 90s was a woman who sued McDonald's because she had spilled McDonald's coffee on herself and burnt herself with hot coffee. And she was actually injured fairly severely, and the substance of the lawsuit was focused on whether McDonald's coffee was unreasonably hot. But to a lot of people hearing about this case on the news, it just seemed flatly ridiculous. Of course, coffee's hot. Everybody knows that. You can't sue for your own clumsiness. And so a lot of my friends get this impression that people can sue a corporation for anything. It's like, well, yes, people sue for all kinds of things. And you hear about those cases in the news when they win. You don't hear about the million other cases that lose which is by far the more common outcome. And various legal scholars have talked about this organizational advantage in courtrooms and have explored different mechanisms that give organizations an advantage. One legal scholar, Mark Gallanter, detailed a few of these advantages of corporations, and he says some of them come from the fact that corporations, by their nature, participate in law a lot more often. They're a lot more involved in litigation. Partly because if you have thousands or millions of customers and many suppliers and all these different interactions you're making to people all the time, you have many more conflicts and some proportion of those conflicts will go to court. So organizations participate in litigation a lot more and as repeat players in the system, and one way they work the system is by being prepared in advance. So organizations often have this ability to structure transactions in their favor. And you see this with all the contracts you sign. We talked about this earlier. Contract law assumes a contract is something negotiated between two parties, but most contracts you sign with companies, you don't negotiate in the slightest. They just give you the contract and say, sign this if you want our services. If you want to download Apple software, you click agree to their terms of service, despite the fact that it's a 20-page document you've probably never read and you've certainly had zero input on. But it's the only way to get their product, and they're the only one making that product. If you book a flight with an air company, you're agreeing to all their rules and the terms of their service and their contract, but you don't have an airplane, so what else can you do? So corporations, through having these complicated sets of legal rules, are able to structure transactions in their favor. So if a conflict does arise and you do want to take your case to court because you think you've been treated badly or ripped off or whatever, you'll often find that they've had some contingency in the fine print of their contract, absolving them of all responsibility. Another ability that these corporate repeat players have is the ability to, as Mark Gallanter puts it, play for the rules. So you're an ordinary person who's been injured by a defective product or ripped off by a dishonest company, and you want to get your money back or get some damages or have your hospital bills paid. That's, that's your one conflict. That's your one case. And you sue them, and maybe you're successful, maybe you're not, but then it's over with for you. For the company, though... That's just one of 20 or 30 or 100 cases they're expecting to have over this issue. So from your perspective, if you spend more money on a lawyer than you get in damages, it's a bad deal. What's the point of even suing for damages if you're worse off than you were before financially? For the company, it's a good deal. So let's suppose the company is only being sued for $5,000. Does it make sense for them to spend $20,000 to try to win the lawsuit? Why, yes, it does. Because if they win, that means there's a precedent now in their favor. And they're probably expecting, okay, if there's one case against us, it's probably going to be 20, 30, 40 more other cases. And we're way more likely to win these subsequent cases now that we have a decision in our favor because civil law is based on precedent. And the future cases will be decided according to how this case is decided. 
And for this reason, companies might even initiate litigation on their own in what they call test cases. Cases where they pick some issue that they think's worth their while to have a legal precedent in their favor on, and they dump a lot of legal resources, a lot of time and effort and lawyers' fees into trying to win this case to test the waters and see if they can establish that precedent in their favor. And these are just a few of the advantages that corporations might have in civil litigation, advantages that accrue to people who are repeat players and know how the system works.